Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, next edition of IDC Market Watch. In this series, we bring in analysts that are experts in their specific fields, and we torture them. Uh, we bring them on top of the wall, uh, like Game of Thrones, to watch out on what's happening in the market. Today, I'm really, really happy to have uh, with me uh, Manish Ranjan, joining us from Dubai, and Carla Arendt, uh, joining us from Denmark. Manish and Carla, are experts in the cloud field and they really have researched this market extensively. So uh, no surprise, we're gonna be talking about clouds today. Um, and before we get into the serious stuff, uh, I just wanted to ask uh, Carla first and then Manish uh, a question uh, because uh, cloud has been around for now a good 15 years as a topic. And I remember there was an analyst back then uh, when this has started, uh, I'm not going to say the name, but it started with G. Uh, they were saying, uh, you know, cloud is the keyword, is a buzzword. Uh, it's going to disappear because everything will become cloud. We're going to stop talking about cloud. That analyst was clearly not right, uh, we can fairly say. Uh, but I wanted to ask both of you guys, um, what's your horror story around cloud? Is there any, any anecdote over the past you know, few years that you have uh, collected uh, around cloud. And I'm going to ask Carla first, what's your horror story around uh, cloud, Carla? I'm not sure if it's a horror story, but I have to say that I have definitely been too optimistic in terms of how quickly organizations would be adopting the cloud. And I have uh, predicted the point of 50% uh, of workloads and data in the cloud a few times. <laughs> and I think we are still not there. <laughs> so, so that would be my uh, mishap in the cloud. Hmm. Optimism, optimism. Yeah, it can be a double-edged sword. Yes, can be. But it's better to be optimistic than than to than to see to see dark. Uh, uh, Manish, what about you? I mean, you've been also kind of talking to vendors and talking to buyers around cloud for a long, long time. What's what's your story? Uh, I I would not say a horror story, but uh, one of the interesting uh, you know um, story that came up was around seven, eight years before from the Middle East and Africa region. Uh, where one of the government entities, um, they were tasked to launch a cloud-first policy. And they got a lot of issues from the internal government entities that how do I you know, own the hardware when we don't have the hardware? How do I keep on paying every year, right? So they had a different way to procure cloud. So it was very difficult to convince their procurement and finance team that you are going to pay, but you're not going to own the hardware. And that too, it's going to be completely based on consumption, right? Uh, you don't have to procure hardware, then you utilize it. You have to provision uh, something that you don't see in your premises. So it was more of a kind of uh, early stages of cloud conversation where people were not ready. Uh, so I think that was quite interesting. Yeah, yeah that's quite quite interesting. Thanks for sharing that. And this idea of I remember back in the day, you're kind of um, hugging, hugging your servers, hugging your your hardware. I think uh, I think that's that was quite that's quite interesting. And uh, yeah, it's just psychologically uh, there's there's something in there, right, for having and seeing and touching your your assets, right. So, uh, however, I think in the past, you know, uh, decade really, we have we have kind of uh, developed and evolved our thinking quite a bit. And in fact, something I I would tend to say, I'm not sure if you guys agree, is that uh, we are now, uh, this is not your your grandpa's cloud anymore. This is not, not the, the early stage cloud anymore. In fact, things have evolved so much and this has become so pervasive that the sophistication level uh, around cloud is now pretty, pretty uh, high. Um, and maybe I wanted to kind of ask uh, the first uh, serious question to you, Carla, uh, around that. Um, what what is where are we in that journey? Right? So what's the sophistication level around selection, around procurement, uh, deployment? You know, how has this changed in the past uh, in the past few years? Yeah, I think that's uh, fascinating to watch, and that's why I'm so glad that I'm in the cloud space um, because it has evolved a lot over the past uh, ten years since we started the research in the space, and um, I think it has moved from cloud migration being just another technology upgrade to cloud today really being the foundation for the digital business. So we see a much closer alignment between cloud strategies and business strategies. 
And I think that's also necessary because if customers are treating cloud just like just another technology platform, then they will not get all the benefits that cloud can provide because there's so much innovation happening on the cloud that that customers are missing out on if they are only looking at uh, you know what is what are the the specs of the compute and storage uh, requirements. So that is one shift. It's becoming much more. Um, business relevant and business critical. The other shift is that um, we see an evolution of cloud strategies as well, um, moving from cloud first strategies like you referred to Manish uh, just a moment ago, towards more application first, uh, data first, and I think ultimately value first strategies. So it's not anymore about moving everything into the cloud, but customers are becoming so much more sophisticated about which workloads they want to put into which cloud, which data sets into which cloud. Um, they understand the requirements of the applications and data sets much better, and they make much more sophisticated choices about uh, placement of, of workloads and, and data. So that is also an evolution. Yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, me as a data analytics person, right? So when uh, data first always always ticks my mind. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, but yes, I uh, in conversations uh, with uh, IT buyers and CIOs and uh, and all the new roles that have happened in uh, linked to the cloud space, it's clear mm -hmm. that the decision factors around the workloads on the value that's been driven. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's been a pretty pretty dramatic shift uh, uh, shift there. Um, and of course, we cannot talk about about cloud because you know, we talk about data a little bit. Uh, but uh, there are some. Uh, there is a big beast now that has entered <laughs> entered the chat, uh, as, as they say, in the past yeah. uh, in the past uh, year and a half. Uh, and that is, of course, Gen AI and the impact on, on AI more broadly. Um, so maybe asking asking Manish first, and then, then coming to us, I would like to hear from you as well, Carla, for thoughts. Uh, around the, um, the impact that Gen AI and this big hype and this big kind of uh, volumes of, of talk and, and technology have had uh, on cloud specifically. How, how has Gen AI changed uh, the cloud uh, landscape, if, if it has changed? Uh, it, it definitely has, uh, to be honest, because we have been observing the, the massive uh, you know, uh, changes in the overall marketing landscape, you know, where we have majority of deals coming around the chain AI collaboration, people are collaborating, and that has created a lot of opportunity for hyperscalers. Um, it's, it's not just the independent software vendors who are partnering with these hyperscalers to be able to procure the needed uh, GPU and maybe uh, processing, uh, no, uh, accelerated processing powers. They also have to leverage some of the uh, platforms that these hyperscalers have invested, especially Microsoft, Google and AWS. Uh, and definitely it has created a lot of uh, opportunity purely from the platform side where they are opening up the platform for the government from the end user's perspective um, and some of the large enterprises who are investing in Gen AI capabilities, trying to uh, uh, leverage hyperscalers infrastructure to be able to run those uh, large language models or any language models, uh, which requires uh, strong compute power and at the same time from platform side in, in terms of you know um, testing those inferences and, and running those inferences uh, these hyperscalers have actually become an entry point so it has clearly impacted their overall revenue stream and that's how we have seen the last six to eight months all the major hyperscalers they started launching their uh, uh, different Gen AI capabilities from different stack, starting from applications to platform driven infrastructure. So it has really uh, created that ripple in the market and hyperscalers are way ahead in terms of providing that available ecosystem for the software vendors and also the end users to try and test the Gen AI capabilities. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Manish. No, that's that's great. And and Perla, maybe what's what's your take? I mean, you, I mean, clearly you have extensive relations with all the big cloud providers in the region, and and also with the with some of the smaller players. Well, what's the differentiation play around Gen AI? Are this is, are they playing it in a different uh, way, or is it kind of um, competing head to head as it was in the past around the core cloud services? It's still a head to head competition. 
but um, but it's changing the playing field uh, a little bit because um, you know some cloud providers uh, have focused on data on the data portion more than others from the beginning. Uh, some have made some partnerships. Some have developed uh, their own capabilities. So I think it is changing the game a little bit, but it's still uh, a head-to-head -head competition. And what I find interesting by talking to CIOs uh, about their strategies around uh, AI, Gen AI, and where they're going to deploy these new applications and workloads, um, right now they're actually anticipating that the their AI adoption will unfold in a similar way than the cloud adoption has unfolded. And they they believe they will have a hybrid infrastructure um, in the end or in in a few years time. So our survey is actually showing that uh, even though organizations want to use the cloud and cloud services uh, for experimentation and proof of concepts, at the moment they are thinking that they will move production workloads back to on prem or run in a hybrid model, which I think is a sign of uh, maybe that immaturity uh, of the the strategies and you know people not having a lot of experience with it because it's a new technology because i'm i'm not sure it's actually practical to move uh, an application like a large scale ai or gen ai application back to on prem right um but that's that's the thinking right now and it's been quite consistent across different surveys that customers um do anticipate a hybrid architecture rather than pushing everything into the public cloud it's, it's fascinating what you're saying. So it's, it's, it feels like almost like the fast forward repeat of what we saw on cloud. Uh, yeah. I, I see the same as you see some similar thinking, but happening just much faster, right? So uh, yeah. the same sort of conversation that took three, four, five years in cloud. Now we're having mm -hmm. them in three, four, five months on on Gen AI and the likes. Uh, yeah. So, so that's that's fascinating. Um, it, it, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask a, a, tough, a tougher question. Now it's gonna go to Manish. Uh, this one, um, and um, and this is really around uh, you know the fact that we you know Gen AI is now boosting some of the demands. Uh, certainly, uh, making uh, buyers aware that they probably need to invest again uh, additional on cloud. Um, uh, but also this happens against the backdrop whereby the cloud was an emerging market for many many years growing at 30%, 40% plus. Uh, now, our focus for this year is that uh, cloud, public cloud services will only grow, only, uh, in, many, in many spaces, uh, we'll be happy to grow at 20, but they will grow at only 20% this year. Um, so uh, what's, your, what's your take on that? Why, why is that growth uh, kind of subsided and what's gonna come next, Manish? Sure. So, Alan, and to answer to that, uh, Giorgio, I really wanted to you know, showcase the real size of public cloud services today. So we are talking about 163 billion size of public cloud services in 2023. And the size of the technology is already quite mature, I would say. Um, and then uh, it's going to grow by around 22%. So you are absolutely right. We are going to witness uh, the growth in the range of uh, early 20s, uh, so almost five, seven, eight years before, we would have seen much accelerated growth. And that has slowed down. Um, that's because of the multiple factors. One, the technology is becoming quite mature now, especially from your software side. So your software, which is deployed on cloud, uh, that gives your SaaS and PaaS. And we see that almost 50% of your SaaS and PaaS is already deployed on your public cloud services in 2023. Now that is going to grow to become around 72% of your total software, which will be deployed on the cloud by 2028. So the maturity of your cloud adoption has started back in 2016, 2017. So for the last 10 years, so uh, if you look at last five years of trend and the next five years of trend, we see that the maturity curve is moving towards cloud. Um, if you look at the total software, your SaaS and PaaS, that covers around 83% of your total public cloud services. So such a big chunk of your cloud where your adoption of your SCM applications or enterprise asset management or collaboration applications, unified communications, even procurement applications, all of these initial workloads were already migrated to the cloud. Now, majority of your 
workload related discussion happens on some of the platforms, which is still purely on on premises, especially around your data management platforms or databases, uh, where you have majority of legacy still running on on premises. Uh, but that's the area where we will see some of the fastest growth in the near future. But if you look at the overall size of the market, uh, growing at this at the uh, compound annual growth rate of around twenty percent, that still is a major major uh, growth triggers. And that too, when we already have witnessed around uh, some macroeconomic uh, indicators, so some macroeconomic factor, which is actually affecting your cloud growth. Uh, think of uh, the the uh, all of these inflation related issues that the uh, EMEA has witnessed. Uh, some of the conflicts in the region that has also slowed down the cloud adoption uh, significantly in few of the European markets. Uh, but eventually, you know, some of the workloads which are still going to grow much faster than the overall cloud growth is something that where we see some silver lining from a cloud perspective. Thank you. No, thanks, Manisha. That's uh, that's insightful and. And I think that tipping point uh, been reached in some areas, but still to be reached in some others. That that's my key takeaway there. And uh, and yeah, I mean, let's take the let's take the uh, the work, let's take the working tools, and keep keep working on that. Uh, and that seems to be the message uh, the message there. Now I wanted to switch gear and just a, a couple of final questions as we as we near towards the at the end of our session today. Um, the first question, and maybe I'll start with you, Carla here. Um, we're talking about hype, we're talking about resets, we're talking about you know what's real, what's not real. And I I gotta say, I am um I am not always sure that this concept of uh digital sovereignty or cloud sovereignty or all, all this sovereignty stuff that we hear about in Europe, but also I think in the Middle East uh, it's becoming a topic. Uh I'm not sure if that's more than political jargon or or, or kind of political posturing. Is, is there anything real in that in that trend from your standpoint, Karma? Yeah, I would definitely say it's real. Um, it's uh, most real, I would say, for public sector customers and uh, local governments. Um, they have been struggling to adopt the cloud for many years, um, but they have their concerns, of course, around who owns the infrastructure, and um, you know they they support. Uh, and governments and states and nations, so they they have to make sure that they are not dependent on on other people for for infrastructure. So they they have been leading the way. So it it started. I would agree with you. It started as a political initiative, um, but uh, but we also see it uh, in in many other um, industries now because uh, organizations find that um, they want the additional layer of trust that a sovereign solution can give them and the, the additional layer of trust that it can create with their customers. So we see it in other regulated industries in, in banking, finance, um, healthcare, but even in retail sometimes uh, it, it comes up as a as a topic where I would have said retail is maybe the least um, prone to, to be concerned about sovereignty, but they find that um, if they really want to create a deep level of trust with their customers, they need to demonstrate that they handle the data correctly and, and not only at the data layer, but also all the way down to the infrastructure. So it's definitely real. We actually just got the our global digital sovereignty survey back that uh, Rahil Nazir is, is running for us. And, um, and there are some super interesting results there. Um, 44% of organizations said they are already using a sovereign cloud so solution, and that's across all industries. And uh, there was also a high percentage saying that they are investing or they want to invest in a sovereign cloud solution in the next uh, 12 months. So it's definitely real. If, if I can add a couple of points here. So I completely agree with Carla, and especially if I uh, double click on the Middle East and Africa, uh, data residing within the country's boundary was one of the biggest uh, criteria. And to meet that, and then also to tap the growing opportunity from cloud side, uh, almost every hyperscalers made their investment just to uh, you know, uh, cover that sovereignty aspect of uh, the data security. Um, and, and, and that has actually uh, paved the way for the hyperscalers, but still, you'd see a mix of workloads, uh, especially from, as Carla mentioned, regulated sectors like government, healthcare, banking, financial sector, uh, in fact, oil and gas as well. Uh, certain workloads will still find their ways towards private cloud. 
or or even on a traditional cloud environment. Um, no matter how strongly uh, the the central bank is aligned with the hyperscalers, the uh, banking application, the core banking application, will still be on a private cloud. Uh, that's one of the biggest factor, and this is actually changing the landscape of uh, sovereign cloud. Um, I would also uh, uh, bring back the example that Carla mentioned about the Gen AI. So a lot of uh, large language models would be tested in a public cloud environment, uh, but the moment they have to implement or they have to come up with the inferences, they would tend to you know, move everything back onto the either private cloud or into on-premises because running those inferencing or running those testing is based on the public data, you know, uh, the billions of you know, uh, data that the parameters that they use. And that's quite visible uh, for all the Gen AI discussions that we have within the region with the CIOs. They don't mind using some of the virtual GPUs to, you know, uh, to run those or to, to train those models. Um, but the moment they have to feed into the actual data, uh, that's where they are hesitant to, you know, uh, leave the data outside of the country. So uh, data sovereignty is a, is a real thing. And then we have seen uh, how it has pushed the local investments significantly. Mm -hmm. And maybe if I can just follow up on that one, actually, Manish, um, the, another uh, uh, data point from the Global Digital Sovereignty Survey is that 35% of organizations said that they are currently using only on-prem IT and sovereign cloud would be the only cloud solution that they would use. So it can actually help to unlock a bigger part of the market um, of organizations who are not using the cloud today, but would use a sovereign cloud if there was a, a suitable um, solution available in their country. Yeah. So I think that's, that's very interesting. So I hope okay. I, uh, Rahil will forgive me for spilling all the... Not me. Not me. Okay, you guys convince me. So it's quite interesting. The mix of trust. There is of course national security, especially in some public sector agencies, and then then also this idea that a legacy environment are intersecting now with the opportunity, and also in some ways the workload migration around the sovereign crowds. And of course, we see in the hyperscalers also investing in solutions yeah. or packaging or partners in there. So okay, it's real. Okay, it's real. I'll I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll agree. It's real. I read you. Um, all right. Thank you for the thoughts so far. I I think we're gonna go to a final uh, kind of quick uh, fun fun commentary uh, on on from both of you uh, before we wrap this session up. Uh, we kind of we started looking back at what were the myths, what were the horror stories of of cloud, the analysts making uh, unconscious predictions around cloud. Uh, if you were to look forward uh, and you know, taking the uh, taking a brave approach, maybe going to you, Carla, first. Uh, what's your prediction uh, for cloud in the next ten years? Uh, what's what's going to happen to cloud in the next ten years? <laughs> I think that um, all IT is going to look like a cloud and operate like a cloud. It's uh, probably not going to be in a public cloud necessarily, but I think we will adopt the operating model of cloud everywhere. We will use the automation that cloud provides everywhere. Um, so I think IT will, will be a cloud um, and it will be probably less dependent on the location. Is it public cloud? Is it private cloud? You know, where does it reside? But just adopting the operating model everywhere, that would be my assumption. And maybe it will become invisible, Giorgio. Maybe you will finally be right, <laughs> because uh, that's it's just going to be the way it is. But it's it might take another ten years to get there. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I I might finally be right after just it just going to take twenty years as opposed to just a few years. <laughs> uh, the invisible invisible cloud. Well, oh, thanks, Carla. And Manish, thoughts from you? Any 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 prediction? Unconscious prediction from you as we wrap this up. Uh, sure. Uh, so while the slide talks about the fastest growing cloud workloads, I'm going to uh, cover that point uh, shortly after my prediction. So uh, after the COVID, we have already seen accelerated cloud adoption. And then maybe during 2020 or 2023, we saw some, you know, um, some changes in the way those companies adopted cloud before, right? So it was more of a, a whimsical approach to just ensure that there is a business continuity. They ensure that, okay, their, their business is migrating onto a digital platform. So they selected cloud. 
And after two years, you know, starting from 2022 to 2023, we started looking at you know, companies picking and choosing the best cloud solutions based on uh, the workloads that they have to run. So that actually increased the complexity. Uh, we started uh, looking at a situation where we have a hybrid multi-cloud environment. So it's going to create a lot of complexity. And that's where, you know, the concept of uh, actually uh, looking at your ROIs, you know, kind of uh, cloud FinOps is going to be a big thing because given the complexity of your cloud and multiple cloud environments, uh, that too, when you have very thin line where you, you don't know which one is in a public cloud environment, which one you run in a private cloud environment, you have data classification practices, you have this Gen AI, which is going to maybe accelerate some of the workloads more from the AI perspective. It's going to be much more complex. So I think there would be a lot of uh, uh, education and training needed from the hyperscalers, as well as the system integrators and service providers, especially cloud service providers, the professional cloud service providers. So that's going to be crucial to increase the skills availability into the market, depending on industry specific workloads or the product specific workloads. So that's going to be crucial for the next 10 years, if you ask me, Georgia. Now, coming back to the fastest, coming back to the fastest growing workloads, mm -hmm. um, we, we are looking at rest of software, which is your SaaS and PaaS, which is purely on cloud. That mm -hmm. covers around 83% of your total software, software market, which is on cloud. And that is going to grow just by 17% because we already have seen some maturity in those workloads. Now the fastest workloads would be growing at much faster rate. Of course, we have number one as AI platform where the Gen AI uh, uh, platform sits there and it's going to grow at, a, at a CAGR of around 50 plus percent over the next five years time frame. We also have uh, integration and orchestration middleware. So we still have a lot of uh, organizations who are still running on legacy infrastructure. It's not that they can't do it. It's because of the complexity that it brings in. You have to have the complete revamp in order to get away from your legacy infrastructure. And that's where the API integration is the solutions. And we see a lot of uh, projects you know, where it's all around the integration. Uh, your application development is going to be triggered because of the need of your uh, cloud-based uh, apps modernization, right? Engineering applications, again, going to be very industry specific. Uh, you have your application platform and not to forget your analytics and VI solutions. So that's going to be feeded into the fastest growing workloads um, into the region. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's oh, going to be complex. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Manish. That's great, great overview and great, great predictions as well. So a lot more workloads, a lot more complex, and becoming visible, finally, hopefully. We'll see. <laughs> But you still need to kind of understand what's going on underneath. So uh, it'll, it'll remain, it'll remain uh, not boring, uh, that's for sure. Uh, but I wanted to thank really both, both you, Manish, and Carla for, for spending the time with us today on the IBC Market Watch. Uh, thank also the listeners. If you have questions, put them in the chat. We'll pick them up once we close the, the session. Also, look at the chat. There will be some links uh, for, for material. And, and do sign up on the LinkedIn site for IDC uh, Europe so you can get uh, updated on, on this sort of content in the next uh, future. Thank you everyone for listening. Wish everybody a good afternoon. Thank you so much.